All right, thanks everybody for coming to our session today. Uh, we're we're going to be talking about the data capsule appliance for research analysis of restricted and sensitive data and academic libraries grant that we have from the Institute for Museum and Library Services. Uh, my name is Robert McDonald. I'm from Indiana University. Uh, up, uh, talking uh, after me with a brief intro of the data capsule appliance will be uh, Ina Cooper, who's also from Indiana University and, and head of our uh, Data to Insights Center. After Ina will be Eric Mitchell from the University of California, Berkeley, and then we'll wrap up with John Unsworth uh, from the University of Virginia. And uh, what we'll be talking a bit about today is uh, how we've uh, been trying to repurpose our data capsule into more of an appliance for use by archives and libraries with born digital content. Um, I'll give you a, a, the brief overview here. Um, as you'll see from this slide, these are three of the areas that the Hadi Trust Research Center works in now with the Hadi Trust content. Uh, we have our extracted feature sets, which have been a big hit with lots of uh, DH uh, types of users because they can take those feature sets with them and, and do their own analysis with them. We have our HTRC portal, which has some <coughs> built-in analysis tools that, that you can use against uh, uh, the collection of the Hadi Trust Digital Library. And then we have our data capsule here to, the, to, to your far right. And uh, so uh, a couple of years ago, we, we had a uh, kind of pre-CNI seminar that was talking about this type of analysis of born digital content from libraries and archives uh, that, that we were uh, happy to have a lot of different folks around the table using lots of different types of technologies uh, to build different types of data enclaves, some of them from health sciences, some of them like, like Hadi Trust or, or more around um, you know, textual content. Some of them were working with other types of things like video. But um, <coughs> since that time frame, we've been looking to see how the data capsule, uh, since we've got it into a production mode with the Hadi Trust Research Center, uh, could be used um, for the uh, uh, libraries and archives to be able to create their own data enclave for the restricted types of uh, born digital materials so that their curators and archivists could work with it directly, but have it in a secure environment. Um, now, if you've used our data capsule, you probably uh, understand a little bit about how it works, but uh, this uh, diagram just kind of runs through uh, overall what happens in, uh, when it's in place uh, for the Hadi Trust Research Center. And with this, you end up with the snapshot of the VM. Uh, it, uh, it is in kind of a, um, piece to be set up by the researcher and then once they get the virtual machine set up for the kind of tools they want to use for their analysis, uh, they switch it into secure mode and that's when they're able to get access to the copyrighted text and uh, the <coughs> secure volume that become available to them. Once they run their research, all of the uh, uh, components that they do analysis for have to be vetted uh, before they're released back to them. Uh, so that gives you an idea just walking through this. Uh, going between the maintenance mode and the secure mode to get access to the data for Hadi Trust. So the idea here is to take the um, <clears throat> data capsule and put it into place at several libraries that are looking at using this with born digital collections so that they can allow their researchers and curators to get access to that collection in a secure environment. And with that, I'm, uh, uh, the other big piece that I did want to mention is the containerization of what we're doing with the data capsule by way of our recent 4.0 release, and that's what's helping us get there with this project in terms of being able to install it in uh, additional environments like those at UC Berkeley and UVA. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Ina, who will talk a little bit more about the goals of the project and the project deliverables. So, as Robert already mentioned, uh, the assumption that we're building on is that uh, besides Hadi Trust Digital Library, there are a lot of different collections that libraries are working with and they uh, digital collections and they have rich possibilities of working uh, in a computational mode and doing computational kind of analysis, um, but there are different kinds of restrictions that come with some of the collections and it could be copyright similar to Hadi Trust, but it could be other types of sensitivities, uh, you know, confidential information, private information, personal information, and those kinds of things. So extending data capsule uh, that is already an existing technology and has been proven to work well with Hadi Trust Digital Library, extending it beyond Hadi Trust and uh, understanding what, 
what are the needs of the libraries that work with uh, collections computationally, but collections that have restrictions. So that's one of our goals. And then, uh, so extending uh, the, the service and the technology to enable access to restricted data, as I said, but also <coughs> we're looking at trying to understand uh, the skills that are needed to provide such a service, um, access to restricted collections, and um, what is there and what are the gaps in um, such a skill set in libraries. Um, the way we're doing that, I think that's one of the interesting um, parts of the project is that uh, we're working with several partners in libraries and we're working around the framework of participatory design where uh, it's different from when developers come and they collect requirements and then they build a tool and then uh, we see if it's useful or not. We start uh, the partnership right from the beginning and we work together in this uh, library technology kind of collaboration where we, uh, right from the beginning, we discuss what it means to provide restricted access to collections and what it means to provide computational access to restricted collections and then what it means to extend data capsule. So we have uh, partners at different levels and we will uh, list them at the end um, that, that have different modes of engagement, uh, but working through the first steps of data capsule installation and then understanding uh, the difficulties. Um, that, that's the, the, the teamwork that we're doing at Indiana University and along with uh, partners at libraries. Uh, but also the, the second main piece is the software architecture and you know, changing the data capsule uh, <coughs> itself, modifying it. Oh, can you move to the next slide? Yeah, I'm moving <laughs> my last one. Um, so the deliverables, you know, because we have this dual nature of participatory design and software architecture, uh, we're trying to understand, on one hand, uh, gain the knowledge of restricted collections and their policies and context of use, but then at the same time, uh, packaging data capsule as an appliance and making it useful uh, for using in different collection types. Um, meanwhile, understanding these complex uh, library technology research collaborations that, that <coughs> happen around such uh, complex projects. And we hope that you know, through, we have some community building exercises <laughs> built into the project, so we hope that one of the deliverables would be an emerging sense of community that's coming out um, of this work. Great, so our use case involved video. And I picked video because it's not text. Um, and this has been used with text exclusively so far. I picked video because we actually have a large collection of video from a Virginia television station, which is all in copyright, um, WSLS. And I picked that collection because they're actually happy to have us share that, so the risk is low. But video is a great example of content which will almost <laughs> certainly be under copyright and you know have restrictions on its use. So our particular use case is low risk, but we're dealing with a kind of content that is both uh, generally speaking high risk in terms of the legal restrictions and also computationally challenging. So if you want to process video, uh, it takes large amounts of computational power to do complicated things with large amounts of it. And what we're uh, <coughs> doing with the video is running different kinds of captioning software on that. Uh, the slide says new urgency now that Apple has bought the pop-up archive captioning <laughs> service. I don't know how closely you all follow this, but pop-up archive was actually what we were using uh, to do our captioning and they shut their doors on Thanksgiving <coughs> with very little warning to their user committee um, after having been bought up by Apple, um, which is concerning, um, but there are other uh, packages out there that we can use and we're now trying to see which ones work better for which, kind of, which parts of the problem. Um, we are particularly interested in trying to create uh, a push button installation package that uh, you can hand to a library and say, okay, uh, you know, run this and you will end up with a data capsule. Um, there are definitely people at Berkeley who are working on parts of that problem and people at Indiana and people at Virginia, so that's something that we all have our hands in. And not surprisingly, in the course of uh, trying to do that, we're finding all the ways that the data capsule has been hardwired 
to the HTRC environment or to the you know data structures that it expects or the file storage structures that it effect, expects and so on. So that's great. That's what we're supposed to find in this project, and we're finding it. <laughs> so um, we're we're trying to disentangle uh, the data capsule from its native environment and make it easier to export and share in other environments. And we're trying to look at how it might work in other kinds of library projects. So some examples from UVA, you know, that give you context for why we're interested in this problem. Uh, we've been working for about five years now to uh, try to enable computational access to uh, digital collections at the, camp, uh, at the Packard campus of the Library of Congress, so audio and video. Uh, and basically open a research terminal or terminals at Virginia that give researchers computational access into that collection. I will say the challenges have been more bureaucratic than technical um, in that process, but um, gradually, indefatigably, we have made progress. And I believe one day uh, this will actually happen. Um, we're also, uh, we've done some work with Ithaca, and particularly with um, Kate Wittenberg at um, Portico to sort of survey the landscape for uh, text data mining and try to understand what's the perceived need for that uh, among librarians, scholars, and publishers. That's been some interesting work. Um, and we're, you know, I connect that to this effort because in, in my mind at least, understanding the emerging market for text data mining in libraries uh, is part of uh, what we might do with the data capsule work. If we had a data capsule that it was easy to hand to somebody and it was easy for them to set up, it would change the kind of uh, conversations and considerations you'd have around this. Right now, you know, I'll just say libraries generally see themselves as an intermediary between faculty and publishers when it comes to procuring data sets. But what they mostly do at this point when they get them is hand them to faculty and say, good luck. Uh, libraries don't provide a lot of infrastructure for this and uh, you know, they don't really have a, uh, a plan for that um, in, in most places. So I think if the data capsule were part of that conversation, it might change what the library saw as their on the ground role in facilitating research with maybe remote collections that are held by publishers. Um, and finally, uh, you, I have been working for a year or so, a little bit more, uh, with Portico and JSTOR to see if we can't figure out how to do text mining across distributed collections of copyrighted material. Um, you might have heard a, a previous presentation about this or conversation. Originally, we were thinking about co-locating material. That raises so many issues from a legal contractual point of view uh, that it would probably never happen. And, you know, so having a data capsule that you can point at different restricted collections and maybe unify your, your results at the end in some meaningful way uh, would be an important way out. So I have lots of reasons for being interested in this project. So uh, on the UC Berkeley side, um, actually, John, you know, as you're talking, I'm picking up on maybe an educational use case we haven't thought of, and I'll, mm -hmm. maybe I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. But on the UC Berkeley side, We've talked a lot about um, how to provide uh, compute environments for people doing kind of data-focused research, uh, particularly in conjunction with the more Sloan data science environment programs. There's a data science institute uh, in the library, and um, as part of that, we've hired a, a, a postdoc fellow who's been studying software curation. And so um, earlier this year, I guess kind of early in 2017, she worked with uh, John Borgie. So Yasmin Anomany is our postdoc. She worked with uh, John Borgie to study the uh, software curation and data sharing uh, practices of data scientists kind of broadly. And this was one of their uh, somewhat surprising findings is that sure there are cases where people can't share data, but it wasn't for lack of community interest, they actually ran into uh, sensitive data issues. And I think this, this project is interesting to us because it at least gets us one further step down the road of enabling reproducibility on sensitive data. Um, I'm not sure actually how you get all the way down the road of you put the data capsule out in the wild and then somehow federate access to it and all that <laughs> stuff, but um, the notion of being able to provide a secure compute environment that is, uh, matches the uh, restrictions that data might come with is uh, certainly really interesting. Um, I'm sure these slides are available. They, they talked about their study in much more depth than I'm going to do here, and so there's a, a good link to it there. 
and actually uh, Alex Chasanoff and I forget who Thornton's first name is, um, the postdocs actually studied this somewhat broadly, so that's a, a really compelling presentation. Um, kind of in conjunction with this, uh, some of my own research in uh, partnership with Heather Moulais on Sandy and Edward Corrado uh, studied uh, data sharing practices within the library and information science field. And I, I mention this only to say that we kind of found the same issues, is that data privacy um, wound up being uh, kind of a key barrier. Although, as we presented our findings at ASIS, um, we got into a really interesting discussion about whether or not data is even reusable. Um, given, or at least human subject state is reusable given IRB restrictions. Mm. Um, so that, that kind of exploded the topic a little bit more. Um, but there was one, one response here, and it's this, the one, the one under the first uh, green line that says desire to preserve ownership rights that I thought was a really interesting edge use case, case for something like this. I'm not sure that um, as a librarian respecting that desire would be the first thing on my to-do list. Um, but it was kind of an interesting, the kind of the researcher who responded here talked a lot about the work they had put into gathering that data and the interest they had in uh, holding on to some sort of rights to it. Um, and again, this environment would be a way technically for them to enable others to access their data while maintaining that, uh, mm -hmm. those rights. Not ensure that I'd entirely use it. And so John, to the education use case, um, you know, it strikes me that uh, at least at Berkeley, we have a growing undergraduate uh, data science education program and the libraries talked a lot with the uh, mm. people teaching courses there about how to use licensed data sets in their curriculum. Um, and I, I wonder if, you know, I haven't even thought this through a whole lot, but the, this data capsule appliance actually is kind of a risk mitigation tool mm -hmm. that you might use, say, if you were going to try to make uh, licensed or secure data available to 15,000 undergraduates, for example, where um, the sort of one-to-one uh, -one researcher trust that we use when we license data mm -hmm. uh, isn't a realistic expectation. Um, and so where we hope with our outcome, I think on the next slide, that we get to is that this data capsule environment becomes a new secure data service that we offer campus-wide. Um, so uh, across the campus, we've got a great high-performance computing environment called Savio that our research IT group uh, offers. We've got uh, streaming desktops, which is basically the open version of the data capsule uh, through a service called Analytic Virus On Demand, as well as uh, streaming applications through Citrix. Um, we actually use these cases in a few environments to provide access to restricted uh, data where the researcher can have full control. Um, there's some other examples across campus where we built cold rooms, where we maintain computers of different sizes with different sorts of access restrictions where the researchers don't have full control over the data. Mm -hmm. And I know there's from, we, the library doesn't maintain any of those, but I know from talking to our colleagues that those uh, require a lot of staffing. Um, a lot of kind of just-in-case equipment purchasing and a lot of policies around. In fact, uh, one of the most recent problems that one of these groups ran into is that campus IT was trying to provide support for the desktop computers in them and kept violating all the uh, configuration policies on the machines because they weren't, they weren't well-versed, right, in what a cold room was. Um, and so in an ideal case, uh, this becomes a push-button deployment. Uh, it works seamlessly on all of our high-performance infrastructure at Berkeley. Um, and we get to a point where uh, researchers actually could make use of these data capsules uh, in a pretty seamless way. And kind of up next, one of the things we, we looked at a little bit are, are some of the things we're finding with the, with the trials at uh, UVA and Berkeley. And a lot of it, you know, Cliff hinted at a little bit in his opening today, and it's around the, the use of these, these kind of containerized components and how you roll them out in standardized types of environments uh, so that they're you know fast to put out there and easy to use. Uh, but then for us anyway, and, and I don't know if, if uh, members of the panel want to dig a little deeper, but this whole issue of being able to mine across different data sets, uh, the policy issue is, is one of the bigger uh, and thornier kinds of issues because um, with IU's own um, use case for this it'll be political papers that are born digital and uh, of course people are going to want to be able to mine across different segments of those usually by how they're set up in the archival structure. Well one of the bullets that I contributed to that slide had to do with security requirements and you know particularly given the purpose of the data capsule which is to provide secure computation with sensitive data of some kind 
that seems like the, the part of the data capsule that's going to need to evolve and continue to evolve the <coughs> fastest. And, uh, you know, we'll need to be, uh, this is an area where I think containerization actually buys us a lot because we don't have to implement those fixes on eight different operating systems. You know, we can do it once and um, put it out there. I think, uh, you know, Robert and Nina, you could probably speak to technically how you'd solve the non-co-located data issue. Um, you know, I was in the session just ahead of this one where uh, they were talking about uh, a national data repository archive for Canada, and I was wondering how, like, how you would attach this sort of environment to that, you know, where they would sync their 30 terabyte data set into a research platform, or um, I don't know if you've got any words of wisdom about how you'd actually technically solve that problem mm -hmm. or not. <coughs> we barely started a discussion on this, and I, I think, uh, you know, yeah, we don't know yet. Yeah, that's why it's research. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, and a lot of people, you know, are, are kind of uh, moving toward the use of uh, uh, Globus, and that was what the last panel talked a little bit about. Um, and that does help you when you can move your data around. Um, in, in the HTRC implementation, we're not moving that data around. There's the one copy that's used for the mining, and then there's the compute that's in place near the data, so you don't have to move it around. And that's, I mean, that's a key factor. But thinking about what you would use for that kind of analysis in your own, you know, what kind of compute power you would use yourself if you were to build one of these. Uh, this is another issue that's come up in the Big Ten anyway with the new uh, Clarivit contract. Uh, folks will be able to get uh, most of that uh, 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 science citation data to be mined. But right now, there are very few enclaves set up to actually do anything with it. Uh, one of those is at a research center at IU. Um, and they've been running it for a while because there's a lot of research interest in it. Um, but there's a whole lot of data cleaning that goes into cleaning up that package to make it usable for that kind of enclave. We had a few um, other discussion topics um, just to kind of throw out to the audience to see, um, you know, if there were other use cases that you guys are facing now. <laughs> <laughs> and other kinds of um, um, licensing components that are coming up uh, in your own work uh, that might be of interest to this group. <laughs> <laughs>